wanted to build a platform that has the same usability as like Web 2. So we have all the classic Web 2 components, but really pair them with Web 3 functionality. It took a long time to actually having some reasonable retention. We're over 600,000 paired wallets at this point in time, 500,000 sign up, 150,000 monthly active users. Monetization and distribution are really empowered through the ownership. Your account owns your digital footprint. But from the monetization perspective, like users who participate within Discover can be rewarded. Ownership, monetization, and distribution, putting all three of those together makes up the sauce of what Discover is intended to be. Welcome to another episode of Boxster. I'm here with Rick, the co-founder and CEO of Discover, which is spelled D-S-C-R-V-R, um, but pronounced Discover. So let's start with the story behind it. It's the main reason that you chose this particular name, because the name Discover uh, was already taken, or was it just intentional? <laughs> was like, what was the thought process behind it? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Um, you know, we first, I was looking for domains and we actually like almost ended up on this name called Polis. And I was like, cause it means society, uh, possibly in Greek or something. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, it's cool. It's a fun name. Uh, the domain was available and everything, but, um, it just like, it just didn't feel right. So I was just typing in domain names. And I was like, I really liked like discovery or discovering something. Uh, and I've always been one to like remove vowels from words. So uh, I tried discover like DSCVR and it was available, but only in dot O and E. Uh, and I was like, okay, what is dot O and E? And I looked it up and it was, I can, and I was like, okay, that's good enough. You know, <laughs> that's as uh, <laughs> best I can do. So, um, tried out the name and like, quite honestly, it's like a plus or minus situation where some people like instantly get the name. Uh, but it seems to be memorable. Like people are able to like, remember the domain name and come back to the site. So that's what matters. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. It's interesting. I like it. And even the fact that we're having a conversation about it, it's, it's, it's good. Um, so yeah. you guys launched on Solana in October, 2023 and in March, 2024, you reported, um, 450k, uh, connected wallets. 400k monthly users, over 25 million posts and reactions, uh, which sounds impressive. So could you just tell me a bit more about how has it progressed since then? Because my initial reaction was that normally it's a bit easier at the beginning to onboard new users. And yeah. while we see is that the traction deteriorates over time. Um, have you experienced that? And uh, do you have any numbers for me? Yeah, we're, I mean, we're over 600,000 paired wallets at this point in time, uh, over 500,000 signups. I think last I looked, it was like 560, 570 or so. Uh, our DAO has definitely increased since then. So we have like 150,000 ish monthly active users. So those are like people coming to the platform and actually interacting with it. But it's about 75,000 on average daily active users. And those are like people who actually come to the site and interact with it some way. So they're actually logged in. And like what's important to us too is like we're a site that people browse. So um, you don't have to be logged in to actually use Discover. So you can just come to the platform, browse through the feeds. But like, if you want to start interacting with it or start engaging with it, obviously you have to create an account. Um, so it's really about like how many of those users who are actually logged in and how many of those users who are like lurking, are we actually converting is what's important. Uh, posts and comments is, and, and upvotes as well over that number also. Um, but it's, uh, you know, we've seen continued growth and we've seen like continually to hold the numbers that we have. So it wasn't this big spike. But I, like, I'd really point out, it wasn't like, it took a long time to actually get to the point of like having some sort of reasonable retention. That's really good. And what I like about a platform is that, as you said, there are levels to it. So you can just browse and then you can sign up with your email and then you have the option to connect your wallet, uh, whether it's like MetaMask or anything else. Um, yeah. And I think that's the best way to onboard users because everyone is talking about the next billion but for us to be able to do it, we need to do it gradually and allow people to just tip their toes and essentially 
realize the benefits of Web3 and then onboard fully. So I I really like the approach because when I was um, setting up my account, that's something that I, I really like. Um, it's funny because we've been beating around the bush talking about Discover, uh, but we haven't actually talked what exactly you guys do. Um, so could you give me the TODR? I know that you're like a Web2 style social app with um, crypto components. Um, but yeah, could you could you tell me a bit more about it? Yeah, so Discover, we're a, a Web3 social network. Uh, we also have a protocol uh, that we're probably going to be launching in the next couple months. Uh, and the idea is, is like we wanted to build a platform that has the same usability as like Web2. So we have all the classic Web2 components you might find in a social platform, but really pair them with Web3 functionality. So the ability to actually really interact with on-chain assets directly through the platform. And a lot of our users uh, who are signing up right now or who are retaining are really that two and a half user, that Web 2.5 user. So they're like very well aware. They're, they're aware crypto exists, but they're just not like super crypto native users. So you take them, you know, you're, uh, something like swaps or staking might be a little bit, uh, like the ideas behind them or the concepts behind them might be a little bit out of their reach, but in reality, they're very interested in participating within a crypto ecosystem and learning more about what makes uh, crypto fun. So a lot of the content right now is crypto oriented, but we do see communities starting to pop up more and more that are just like classic social communities that have some crypto uh, mechanics baked into them. And when you're talking about the blockchain slash crypto components, I normally associate them with you being able to monetize, you having full ownership over your content and you having control in a way that the platform can't just ban you. Um, so could you run me through these three main components um, and do you provide them? Just, let's just um, delve a bit deeper into that. Yeah, so we really think about these three things, which is the ownership, the monetization, and that distribution. And so like putting those together, you know, wouldn't monetization and distribution are really empowered through the ownership. And for ownership, yeah, your, your account owns your digital footprint. And when our protocol is launched, you'll be able to do things with that ownership of your account. But from the monetization perspective, like users who participate within Discover can be rewarded. So we have users on our platform who are creating content or engaging in communities. And in turn, those communities are rewarding them for their engagement, whether it's earning NFTs or owning, uh, uh, earning fungible tokens, people are being able to monetize their actual digital footprint. And for a distribution, like users who are partners or creators are able to come to our platform uh, and get reach on our platform, which allows them to distribute the content they're creating. But also we have the ability for app developers to come to the platform and develop micro experiences, put them directly within the feed and get distribution for their applications. And to me, like looking at all three of them, like I really focus on empowering the distribution mechanic for users, uh, creators and the partners. So that means that like you have people on the platform who are not only creating content, and they're creators like yourself, but you also have partners. So we're companies who want to get distribution for their product or get more awareness for their product. So I think there's, to me, like putting all three of those together really makes up the sauce of what Discover is intended to be. And as we move forward through that, we're seeing a lot of interest in creators who want to come onto the platform and create uh, their own like social presence and you're seeing partners who want to empower those creators through distribution. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, I really want to talk about your API um, because I know that it's open source. Uh, but before we do that, could we just talk a bit more about control? So how much control do you have over accounts? And the reason that I'm asking is because at the moment, um, Elon Musk could essentially ban anyone from X. Um, if you just simply disagree with um, their fundamental beliefs. And we saw that 
when he did something to Andrew Tate, I don't support any of them. But for me, that was like an amazing example how this just literally highlighted the issues with any Web3 social media platform. Um, yeah. So could you just tell me a bit more about the control that you have over the accounts and could you ban them? Because there there needs to be some regulation that you should be able to ban certain people or to at least ensure that there's no hate speech. But like, how do you balance that? Yeah, you know, so when I think of Discover, Discover.1 is a application built on our protocol. We call our protocol Social Fabric. And the idea, like splitting those in half or splitting them into two buckets, all the users and their digital footprint, like the posts, the comments, the interactions they create are actually all within Social Fabric. And Discover.1, the site you're going to, is really just consuming that social graph. So the social graph exists in the protocol. Discover how one can ban users, um, but the social graph really doesn't have the concept of the ability to ban users. So yeah, a user who's creating hate speech or violating one of the, the site rule policies has the opportunity to get banned. Very happens very rarely, but from a social fabric perspective, like all of their data is still accessible. All of their digital footprint is still accessible. They're just not getting that distribution through our plot, through the Discover One platform. If someone wanted to create a platform where they didn't have those concepts on top of Social Fabric, it could certainly happen. But uh, it is still a really good question on, like, how do you make sure the safety of the users is still uh, possible? And I think, like, from a, a social perspective, there definitely needs to be mechanics, especially in platforms like Discover, to provide safety for the users. And so there's also the ability to ignore users, uh, which takes them out of your feed and doesn't allow, you to, doesn't allow them to follow you or uh, send you notifications and things like that. But at the end, to me, I think it's still really important to give users, like, the transparency and the freedom to express themselves as much as possible. And I do think um, that's an issue that you see with modern social is that like, there is no real transparency. You know, you see that on X quite a bit, like, is my account uh, shadow banned? Is my account like demoted? Like, why am I no longer getting the reach that I'm getting? And I think um, we're discovered that's it's important that we provide the transparency, whether or not they like the answer or not, or whether or not the result, they agree with the results is a different question, but at least having them know uh, the status of their account. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Uh, and you mentioned building a protocol a couple of times. So do you imply your own blockchain? Um, and could you tell me a bit more about it? Also, your build on top of Solana. And I know that it was quite popular at the time they were building uh, in 2023. Oh, no, that's actually not true. Solana was hit in 2003. Reason we chose Solana like the summer it was June, maybe the month before of 23. I don't remember actually. Like I quit look. You just kind of quit looking at token prices right around at that time, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. But uh, we, I went to a conference. It was a hacker house uh, in mid 23, and there's something just about the energy of the ecosystem and like. Everyone was so focused on their projects. Everyone was still incredibly excited. And you just kind of like forgot the narrative that was floating around at Solana because of that hacker house. Um, so that was the moment. And we, we went through a huge re-architecture. It took us like three to four months. And uh, I, I mean, it was the best decision we made, but like, you know, a very lucky decision too. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, I won't doubt that, but um it was definitely really interesting. You know, like we were able to talk to people in the community who were like, hey, get involved with these pro, uh, these DAOs. And some one of them was Monkey DAO, which I jumped into. Super thankful for the community, like incredible developer community there too. But, um, you know, when I think about Discover as a protocol, I really think that our social fabric is abstracted away from the L1 itself. Because like protocol, like social protocols and, I think don't really, they, I don't think this, I know this, they don't have a double spend issue, right? Like you're not, you know, maybe you upvote something twice, maybe you make two comments, maybe that get transaction happens twice. 
it's never really happened in our protocol, but let's say it does. To me, it's just a non-issue. It's uh, it doesn't matter. But like what uh, Solana's L1 is incredibly good at is being an asset layer and a very fast asset layer. Uh, and that store of value to me is really important. So it's like, how do we make deeper integrations into Solana's blockchain? Um, and that's something that we spend a lot of time with. Like, what are the different points that Discover can have these deeper integrations into the L1 while still maintaining the uh, the network, the, the social fabric network? And I think like the social fabric network will continue to expand. But at this point in time, it does maybe like 600,000 transactions a day, uh, which is not like huge, but I, I do think um, as Discover continues to grow, that, that, that number will probably exponentially increase. Um, just to push back on it a bit, you enable users to engage and transact with NFTs and crypto. Um, so it's not necessarily like the double spend, but are you concerned about the downtime on Solana because it's been an issue, hasn't happened recently, so obviously more power to them, and it's a comparatively early project. Uh, but have you have you thought about it? Is this something that concerns you? Um, obviously not as important to you, but just something that is it something that you think about? Yeah, you know, um, it's definitely something we like. I think the it was like right around February, uh, maybe March of this year when uh, transaction a lot of transactions were taking longer than intended, and I do think uh, I mean we've we haven't experienced issues really since, but we had a quite, like quite a bit of like NFTs being minted on the platform, and yeah, it was taking some time, and we put some priority fees in there, which helped quite a bit, but I do think um, it's just like the pain points of scaling and like these, those issues have faded and like, honestly, if they come back, it's probably a good sign that, uh, they're scaling and continuing to grow. Right. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, it sucked, but it was like a massive moment for the ecosystem of seeing this like huge growth. But, uh, you know, looking forward, you have Fire Dancer, which will be, uh, coming out in the next couple months, maybe end of year. And like, you know, it'll just continue to improve. And like, I, I do hope when, uh, as they make those improvements, they continue to hit these roadblocks because whatever those roadblocks are going to be, especially with scalability, most likely means the size of the network has reached, uh, that capacity. And then they'll come up with a new solution or a more improved solution. So I think it's just the pain points, uh, growing, um, a protocol and especially with a protocol with so many consumer users that uh it's uh putting challenges to the paradigms of how current l1s are constructed yeah I'm definitely and definitely global it. state machines are like a freaking complex problem so uh yeah it, there's quite a bit of like to me it's like you see so much growth, especially with inside of like how new applications are being built on that L1, especially, you know, you saw pump fun and a lot of those others, like really put the test of like how scalable this is. And uh, I'm not super aware of their architecture, but I would argue there's probably infinite room for improvement for at least the next couple of years. Yeah, I guess the same principle uh, or the same argument could be made for pretty much any other L1. Um, it's just about choosing your regrets and being aware of the challenges that you have uh, building on a certain protocol. Uh, you mentioned APIs earlier on, and I know that you have open APIs. Um, I think that as like web thing natives, you hear like APIs, SDKs all the time. Um, so could you just give me the TLDR of those and then we'll just the um, we'll just have a in-depth conversation about the way they utilize them. Yeah, you know, um, from a Discover API perspective, for us, it's gone through multiple iterations. And our current iteration is really designed to meet developers about where they're at and what type of tools they're used to consuming. Um, like 
you know, there's a lot of arguments of different ways on like how APIs can be consumed or distributed. And like for us, it's really important that we cre we've created something that not only is the zeitgeist, but actually meets the demands and needs of developers so that they don't have to go out there and like create their own augmentation or their own vision of how it works. But to us, it's like, you know, Discover API is just an API built on social fabric. Anybody technically could build their own API and provide their own vision of what and how that information should be transmitted and consumed. But to me, it's super important that there's a plug and play with a platform like Discover so that developers can like really create their own vision or their own experience on how that should be. Um, and like there's infinite, like APIs have infinite room to improve and that's why they're constantly being iterated upon. But I do think like looking forward, uh, we still have an incredible amount of room to grow our API and like improvements to make to it. Um, but it like, and it's in process too. It's like, uh, I think it's a forever evolving, uh, part of discover. And I think our SDK too, our SDK has like a lot of room to grow, but I do think like, it's really about meeting the current demand of the users and like how they expect, uh, to use the platform. Yeah. And if there's like one thing that you could achieve for your APIs and your SDK by the end of this year, what would that be? Yeah, you know, I think the one of the things that we've been thinking about a lot too is what would it really take for somebody to actually build um, a real fully embedded application and to discover that utilizes not only our social graph, but our asset graph and like seamlessly is integrated uh, with Solana. So like an example of this is like, can you take an application um, like pump.fun or something similar and how would that actually look if it was embedded directly within discover uh, and we also look at gaming quite a bit you know like how would you have a social experience within gaming that fully utilizes our api fully uses the sdk um, and creates this very immersive experience with inside of our platform but it also uh, has a really intelligent way of working with uh, native assets sitting on Solana. Thanks for clarifying that for me. And if I have to be honest with you, I wasn't aware of Discover before our interview, and I really like it. Uh, but I know that uh, Farcaster and Frentech went viral, um, probably around four months ago, if it was like four or five months ago. Um, so could you just tell me how do you compare with them? And it's this essential question that I feel like everyone is asking themselves when we see a new project is why do we need one more? Like what problem are you solving that no one else uh, was able to solve? Because that's why essentially um, having a new project on the market um, implies that there is still uh, an unresolved problem. Uh, so could you just run me through this and and how do you how do you talk about it with your team and how do you think about it? Is this something that keeps you up at night? You know, um, it doesn't really keep me up at all. Uh, I do think like Frentech, Farcaster, Discover are like completely different platforms and address a completely different audience. Um, you know, I do think like Frentech, super interesting, you know, how their approach, um, at the time to, you saw like that massive growth, I think it was like last August. Um, and they've come out with new iterations to their bonding curve to make it more friendly. I do think like, um, but I do think like it's very possible, especially with our SDK and our API to build a friend tech into a community directly on Discover. Um, something that we've seen teams wanting to experiment with. On the other side too, uh, you know, thinking about Farcaster, I think Farcaster is a really interesting product. I really do. Um, I'm a user, I'm a user of both, um, but I do love Web3 Social. So it's like, you know, um, and I think like, I think their approach they're, they had amazing marketing, amazing growth campaigns, uh, 
especially over the last like six or so months. Uh, and you could see that within their Dune analytics of like the, how the, the approach was really effective. And I think their frames launch landed pretty well and they were able to establish a community of builders. Um, so, but I do think at the end of the day, it's just a different type of user. And like, to me, I see the discover user as somebody who's more like wanting to learn about Web3, has these like Web3 tools that they have access to, and especially through Canvas and our new technology allows them to get deep into crypto, uh, but very in a very safe way. But it also allows you to, within sign up, you know, something about Discover, by the time you sign up, you're, you already have a wallet, right? So you could sign up over Gmail or you could be using your native wallet, like your phantom wallet, but by that, or username and password, but the end of the result is you end up with a, a non-custodial wallet. And I do think like another interesting point too, is like from a discoverer's like perspective, we hear that quite a bit. People are like, Hey, I haven't heard of you guys. Um, we really don't spend on marketing. You know, this is like, this is one of our few times that we've actually, you know, really approached marketing and like really pushing the message because we really believe that discover is at that point to where, where we would be looking for more growth. And, you know, from a, daily active users perspective, like it's not, it hasn't hurt us. How about that? Um, you know, the acquisition of users at this point has been almost compute completely grassroots and organic. Like we do have Twitter campaigns and things like that as in, you know, you know, follow to like or whatever, or join the community. But in, in reality, that doesn't help us with sticky users. Um, it really doesn't. And you, most of the acquisition channels that we have, where we get our sticky users are from sources that are definitely not Twitter. Um, but then also, you know, like the KOL approach and things like that, I do think are super effective for spreading message and building awareness. But for us, it never really created a user that stuck around. So for us, it's been like, what is the product, right product for the user and what will retain users has been our primary focus. So over a marketing approach, we've taken a very much a product first approach. Uh, that's definitely something that I want to hear. Uh, I guess everyone wants to hear because that's the most important part. And I believe that the reason that users will keep coming back is because of the product and the marketing effort is essential. But if you don't have a good product, you will definitely struggle with the user attention. Uh, but just to bring you back on what you said earlier, that you're a user of both platforms and Correct me if I'm wrong, but I also think that you're a user of X. And I, I've been struggling with this a lot because I want to be a Web3 native, but I feel like we're not there yet and I'm still on X as well. Uh, but we're also talking about fiat and crypto and I was just telling you how I still have fiat, even though I have the majority of my funds in crypto because I still feel like I need fiat. I can't live just with my crypto um so just the, the first question is like how long do you think it will take us to transition from that from this like web two to web three where the web three natives are just like i'm done with this i don't want to be on any web two platform anymore i just want to be a web three native because for me i also think that it's the way that you define yourself and the way um, do you align your belief? So if you buy Bitcoin, you're a certain type of person, you just believe that like uh, money and state should essentially be separate. And if you buy different protocols, they have a different underlying uh, fundamentals and probably ideology. Um, yeah, so that's a comparatively long question, uh, more, more of a statement, but I hope um, you get what I'm leading with it is like, a, how long would it take us to become Web3 natives or to have the opportunity to be Web3 natives? Uh, but also, when do you think the people that are building Web3 products will have the opportunity to say, I'm done with Web2, I want to be out of it? Ooh, you know, I mean, so the answer to the X question, like, you know, you have to have, like, especially if you work in crypto, you almost have to have an X account. Um, you know, it's like, I think Discover would have almost no reach without the ability to tap into the crypto community that's on X. Um, and it helps build word of mouth. 
and those things. And you see a lot of the other founders that like heavily use, uh, you know, X for their distribution platform, especially for getting the word out. And I do think it's because a lot of times crypto finds itself in this box. And so even I think crypto Twitter is an incredibly, is in a box also, a much larger box. You know, like if crypto Twitter was your world, you would assume the whole world thought every single moment about crypto. <laughs> you know? uh, but I do think like it'll take us a bit. I think the transition is happening and like people are starting to, okay, I'm checking X, but maybe I'll check these other platforms for my news and information. And I think that's where a lot of our lurkers come from. It's like, okay, I've gone through my Twitter feed. Now I'm going to go check uh, my Discover feed. I'm going to go browse my Discords and I'll browse my Telegram. But I think as like users, we can only pick up so many apps, you know? So it's like, what if they're picking up one, they're, they're putting down another. Um, and so I think eventually that's what the transition will be. And like, I always think about that MySpace to Facebook day. Um, I don't remember what it was or what that moment was, but I definitely remember one day I logged into Facebook, probably was like going back and forth. And then just one day I didn't go back. And it was like, maybe months past, you know, a year past. I was like, whoa, what happened to MySpace? You know? Um, Sorry to interrupt, I think how, that's probably... how far away do you think we're on this curve of like, oh, wow. the time of like, oh, I'm not going back to this web two apps anymore. If it's like from one to 10 or uh, one to 100, like how much um, have we already like conquered? Yeah, you know, I think... Um... We're years away, like five, maybe 10 years. But like, I think in five to 10 years, it won't, it'll happen when it's not a thought. It'll happen when Web3 is not a word as much as we thought it is. You know, like you, you don't like the, the transition will be at a moment where we have as a crypto community successfully abstracted away like the protocol or the L1 to the point where it's not really about that anymore. It's about the app. And like, you know, I don't really, like, I'm trying to think about the cloud when like people went from like cloud or, you know, localized computing uh, or self-hosted data centers or so, like when they ran their own data centers to cloud. Like I do remember apps kind of being like, we're on cloud or whatever, but no one cared. And I think that transition will most likely be the same where it's like just blockchains have the scalability and inherent properties that make uh, transfer of value seamless and simple and modern uh, applications will emerge that inherit those in a way that makes sense. Cause like, I do believe users, they care about, you ask any user, I care about decentralization. I care about ownership. I care about all these things. Like any, I believe any human being on the planet might care about it, but do they care enough to do something about it is the real question. Yeah. Like signal. I don't, do you, you've ever used signal or a messenger? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. it's like, it really, it's pretty safe, pretty secure. Uh, you know, hides all like has the property security in place. Um, and you would think that most people would just use an application like that. But in reality, like there's no push. It's like, there's no, like, yes, I want these things, but I'm not going to make change to have those things. And I do think once blockchain and protocols reach that like moment, we'll see the transition. But I do believe like in the next five to 10 years, we'll see that seamless transition where it's just like one day I'm using web two and then one day I'm using web three, but I never even thought about it. And talking yeah. about Signal, I, I'm a big proponent of the concept of network effects. And I think we'll see that with everything, we'll see that with all the L1s. I know that there are like so many, we now have more L1s like Say and C and Tron and all of them are coming. And I, I think that in 10 years, we'll have only five. Or <laughs> the alternative is, I know that we'll have, we'll have many, but most of yeah. the applications will be building only five. Or all these applications will start uh, spinning out their own L1s uh, so they can customize them as much as they want. So I think that we'll see something similar with almost everything and social media is not different. Um, do you think that 
discover will survive and why do you think if you could just say there are like three reasons that i believe um they will still be relevant in five years will still be relevant in 10 years what would you what would your reasons be yeah you know i think our relevancy so like two things to that i, I think interoperability between protocols will become so seamless that um They'll, you'll have protocol specific applications. And I think there was actually a word for that recently, but you'll have protocol specific applications that are like uh, natively uh, able to, or like seamlessly able to interoperate with, be interoperable with other protocols in a way that just makes sense. And I think Discover success is also going to be built on the back of that kind of knowledge where the interoperability of Discover is able to address user concerns or user needs, let's say, from a value asset perspective that makes it continue to be relevant. And I think for Web3 consumer apps, uh, it's tricky. It's super tricky. Uh, one of the biggest things that I've noticed is that it's like site guys 24 seven, like, you know, the platform itself has to be relevant to what is happening within crypto to consume, to continue to have some form of mind share and usability. And that's something we've noticed over the past three years is that like, there's this component of you've got the, the frame of the platform, uh, and you've got the, like, um, you know, the scaffolding there of discover, you know, the social, but what's within inside of that scaffolding is what has to be zeitgeist and it has to maintain what is relevant. So I think as long as Discover can maintain the flexibility and the mod, uh, being modular enough to keep up with the changes of uh, crypto and especially where crypto is headed, to me, that'll guarantee that Discover is around in five years and Discover is around in 10 years. And it's like, as your crypto user, like, Every year, like if you think about like even maybe even six months, how like different it is, like how much the paradigm changes, meme token cycle, NFT cycle, you know, it's like, and these cycles are going to get like, I think the iterations are going to become more and more rapid until it solidifies into like whatever form it's trying to create. And I think it's like, I just see it as this like, symbiotic being of like or like it's just kind of like rapidly evolving uh disruptively um but like this to me is like what the consumer app needs to be too like I, and i think that's the huge difference in web 2 i feel like you can take an approach and be satisfied with the approach for a lot longer uh than you can with a web 3 consumer app yeah, I definitely agree with that thesis. Um, I want to talk about, about a little bit about the features of Discover. Um, as I said, I set up an account and I was looking at what you guys do. And what I really like is how I can personalize it. So there was an option to personalize the feed based on my own interests or to yeah. personalize it based on the people that I follow or based on the portal on the portals so could you just tell me a bit more about the idea behind it um and i'm not on socials actually because i think that they're so addictive and it's so challenging to manage this because you want to be exposed to new ideas you want to be exposed to everything that's happening in the world but you also don't want to spend two hours scrolling down yeah. and because it's like so personalized um you can like fall into this rabbit holes but it's also good to be personalized because you don't want to i personally don't care about bags or i don't care about i don't know certain things so i care about scripture uh, so i don't want to read about anything else uh, but again like how do you find the balance of making it personalized but also ensuring that people don't get addicted to it. And it's not a question for you to solve um, necessarily, but I feel like it's a trend that we'll discuss quite a lot in the next few years. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so for feeds, you know, we've iterated our feed technology 100 times over at this point. 
Uh, and the current iteration that we landed on was through a lot of testing. Like, how do we get a certain time on site or how do we get a certain depth of scroll so that a certain amount of content is seen? And like the main feed, the homepage feed is that like, truly that intersection of like, okay, these are people I follow, communities that I'm part of, but, or, uh, and the, are they commenting, posting? So if I follow someone and they comment on something, should it show up in my feed? And then there's an incredible amount of um, decisions made on like, how big are the, how many people, which are, which are in your social graph have engaged with this content. So everyone's feed should be relatively different but also uh, how do we surface content to you that has uh, and, and like a relationship to you? Like, uh, like maybe your friends are the ones engaging with this, but maybe your friends of friends uh, relative to like how many of those are engaging with it. That's that homepage feed. And then it's like, we're like, well, maybe it's like too much information. So we've created like uh, your follow feed, um, which to me, like, it's it's interesting like it's really it's really about surfacing new things that are happening with inside of the people that you care about but also like portals what communities so a very community specific feed um and the all discover is really like everything that's happening on the platform with minimal amount of your social graph and more of like that global social graph uh how they're interacting with it like the for you feed gets by far the most and i like interestingly enough it's like the portal feed is second like that's what people care about second most uh like the following feed gets good interactions and the all discover but it's like it's really about what meant like give me like content that i want uh that's relevant to me and like just tell me what's happening within the communities that i care about um but like from it like uh a, a true like am i addicted to social perspective um I think it's like those style of algorithms, like we're super aware of, we know how they work. And those are not the type of algorithm approaches that we're trying to take. And a lot of those algorithmic approaches are, I don't really believe are based, like really based off of like um, sentiment and feeling like there's a, be a way better word for it, but it's like reaction and like, like how, how to keep people on the hook. Um, and it's like, it really just boils down to what style of dopamine kick that are you trying to give to your user? And for us, the style of dopamine kick that we're trying to give to our users is like, here's information that is like relevant to you and your friends and users. And like, I think, you know, at times like the TikTok algorithm is not truly, I don't truly based off of like your social graph, more of like, basically probably how it impacts uh, the style of dopamine kick that it's supposed to give you. So mm, that's really like, interesting. I've never thought about it yeah. in that mind frame. Um, could you, I have a few more questions about it, but could you tell me what portals are? Because our viewers might not be aware of it. And I know that oh, yeah. be uh, once yeah, you so sign cool. an account, oh, sorry, Go just that, that weird situation <laughs> where we like both pose, we both start talking simultaneously. But um, <laughs> I was asking about how you enable people to actually start a portal because there is a certain um, points requirement. I think it's 50, don't call me on that, uh, to start a portal. And as soon as you sign an account, you automatically give the required number to any user so they can start a portal and you're essentially incentivizing them to do it and enabling them to do it. Uh, but yeah, tell me more about portals. Why are they so important to you and why are they different? Yeah, so portals are basically community building uh, tools and it's very similar to what you would find as like a subreddit on uh, Reddit. And to us, they're important because they're a way to house or kind of um, encapsulate like a, a discussion or a topic. And like the idea is, is I can create a, a community or a portal that's about 
a specific protocol or st specific style of trading. It could be generic about photography, uh, like photography, hub, which is uh, photography. It could be about music and things like that. But the idea behind it is, is like really encapsulating um, how a specific community wants to interact. And what to me is really important about them is like, it's, they're very robust tools. Like you can create any types of rules and roles within that community um, and really customize that approach. And to me, it's like, you can go from any approach. You could make them NFT gated. So you could be like, hey, I want it, you know, this NFT collection, uh, only people in this community could uh, post, but anybody can comment. Maybe it's anybody with this NFT can post, but anybody with this other NFT collection can comment. So it's like, you can really create hierarchy and how people work. But I also think there's a lot of ways to take it from a token perspective, like a fungible token perspective. Like you could build, like I was saying, you could use the same rule set within Discover communities um, and using its roles to build something like friend tech if you truly wanted to. Um, but I do think like it's used for a lot of different paradigms. And I think like one interesting paradigm is like people want a community where only a certain amount of people can post. So they're like content creators or bloggers. Uh, anybody can comment, anyone can upvote. Uh, so the idea there is like, we're the creators of this community and we're the ones who are like deciding on what is the content, but uh, anybody can interact with it. And I think from looking at from that approach, you can get pretty uh, modular, you can get pretty, um, you can customize it in ways that really fit the needs of your community. And I think like, I actually think the current iteration of it uh, is um, similar to Discord in a lot of ways. So it's like requires some knowledge and thinking to set it up, but I do think we could make better approaches to it. But to me, I wanted to give more tools to users and creators to be able to customize their experience and let through their customization inform us on what we want to know. And it, the, like the product results of it are, it's, it's like a long topic, but it's insanely interesting because it's like people configure communities sometimes in a way that actually speak to a product problem on Discover. Uh, but there's a lot of ways to look at it. No, thanks for clarifying that for me. And apologies for the stupid question because I'm not 100% sure whether prediction market is one of the portals or it's actually one of the features that you enable because I oh, yeah. voted on who's um, who be the Kamala Harris uh, VP and uh, he was saying that if I've made the right choice then I will be put in a pool uh, to be selected um, to win like 100 tokens or something like that. So I was just wondering on like, could you explain that to me? How does it work? Um, is it one of the portals to begin with? Or is it something that you guys are run, running? I, uh, it's it's probably one of the, um, I was actually gonna lie. Someone was telling me about the other day and I saw uh, some information about it. And I think like one, it could be something people are running within the community. Um, and it's like, we see a lot of those, like people trying to experiment in different ways with, like, hey, is this possible? What would the results be? Um, and I think like a lot of testing of like different user behavior is super important, especially within like Web3 consumer. I think it's a, I do think Web3 consumer is completely greenfield. So like actually like figuring out what, uh, what actually fits uh, and what, what behaviors that you're tapping into for consumers is super important. So, yeah, I think and the, the, anybody could create something like this with inside of Discover. Um, and I actually saw somebody who was reaching out to us about plugging in a new prediction market, something like poly market into Discover. Um, but like it's permissionless, like in a lot of ways. So people can just build it and plug it into the platform. And while we're talking about um, viewers and the document kick, um, I noted down how do you monetize it because I think it's very important for people to understand um, how do you monetize Discover and I guess that would help them 
realize uh, what your incentives are. Um, yep. And yeah, could you could you just tell me a bit more about it? Yeah. So right now, most of Discover is monetized um, through ads. Uh, as in, we have projects coming to us looking for distribution for their tokens. And so like we use an intersection of like asset graphs and social graphs to perform these uh, ad placements. And they're like ads that reward users. So like people are claiming loot boxes. And at the end of the day, it's just a, a better way of doing airdrops uh, onto the platform. So now people who have token projects, whether it's NFTs or fungibles, they can come to the platform and set up a way of distributing their tokens to users based off of a bunch of different rules. And like, quite honestly, we don't really focus, like there is monetization capabilities there, but like, we usually just have them redistributed to the users because it's like, it's also a growth mechanic too. So it's, uh, it's far better, uh, for far better for them to just distribute. And there's another two approach too, which is like, we're looking at a, a couple different ways of through transaction fees, but to me, our core KPI, uh, is really about growth and engagement, like really focusing on the engagement on the platform. And I think as a social platform, there's a million ways to monetize. Um, but that monetization is really not our core focus. Our core focus is really about growing the platform. I was, uh, I was wondering, uh, how was the best way to phrase that question? Uh, but you're essentially saying that monetization is not important at this point, but obviously money is important because if you run out of funds, then you won't be able to pay your team. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, how are you planning to do that? I guess um, I'm, I'm honestly not sure on um, how much have you have you raised and how much budget do you have to run. Um, but it, if if that's not something that you're worried about right now, uh, is it because you have enough to sustain the project for the next five years? So you're prioritizing the project, building it, and you think that monetary value will come later on. Or is it because that's who you are as an individual? What's, what's the yeah. idea behind it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for us, you know, we raised a 9 million seed uh, two years ago. Um, and, you know, we have time to operate. Uh, we're currently looking at that next iteration of doing a raise. Um, but I think what's, you know, to me, monetization is important. It's important to understand those mechanics. Uh, and I think we have a lot of different like practical uh, examples of techniques, but it's all, it's all time. Like how much time do we have to focus on either growth or monetization or these different strategies? And to me, it's like, there's a lot of different approaches that can be taken, but like, to me, it's so important to better understand and continue to grow the Web3 user or Web2.5 user, which, you know, if you look at like how much time you have in the, uh, a single day, I think being able to focus on that, that user is super important. Okay. And just to bring us back to the features of Discover, I know that you guys worked in frames. Um, and it's so unfortunate because I don't associate frames as a technology um, or like as a feature with Discover. And my understanding of it is that it essentially enables you to just integrate and in, actually embed applications directly in the feed. Um, and that's an amazing technology. Uh, but could you tell me a bit more about the technology itself and where it comes from who developed it uh, because as i said like i associate it with a certain product and i might be wrong and i think that's the case for quite a lot of uh, viewers and listeners yeah that's a good one so canvas for discover is this technology that we've released and you know have you used telegram mini apps yeah, you know, it's like, it's very, a very similar suite of tools where you have the ability to like have that pop up on Telegram, but for us, we're embedding it into the feed. 
And the idea was, is like, how do you have a very rich experience for an app developer? Uh, also, um, allow, like, give the utility to the developer and freedom to the developer to actually really express themselves with their application. And the reason like, yeah, it's a feature that discover has, but on the, under the hood, it's a technology that people have to, um, really integrate with. But I do think that like the technology is empowering. Um, and I think it also has the ability to be, um, taken out of the feed and put into other locations on the platform. And I think that's what we're going to probably see in the next couple months. Um, but to me, it's like, I can now take a typical web application that I've already created. Uh, and like progressive web apps actually work really well. Telegram mini apps work super well. And with a very minimal amount of changes to its code, it's plug and play with discovers feed. Um, and so like we have, you get access to the user also like, so you can tap into the user who's interacting with it and you can tap into, uh, make requests to their wallet, which we have quite a bit of security layers when communicating with, from that canvas to their wallet, we use blowfish, uh, which is like 95% of all blockchain transactions go through. But, um, so we have this like suite of tools, but it's also sandboxed. So it provides protection for the user. And it's also uh, proxied, which basically means that the communication between the canvas and the user has a security layer to it. And there's a lot of new things or a lot of ways we're taking this approach. Um, but like you can take a, you can make a unity game, export it and embed it right into discover. Now uh, you can take a typical progressive web app, which is like 90% of like uh, blockchain web applications and embed them right into discover. And it also gives you access to the user. And it's like, to me, I really like this approach because like as a developer now I could use the discover user or I could just use their wallet as their identity. And so if the user wants to use my application outside of discover, now they can actually use their application outside of discover without needing the identity layer of discover. And I think that's like, that to me gives the freedom now to the developers. So it's like, I can get my distribution, I can embed it into the feed, I can use a wallet authentication. And if I want to move on to my own platform or grow my application outside of Discover, I have the freedom to do that. And I think to me, this actually speaks to uh, the ethos of like how identity should work. And it's like, should identity be on the Discover side? It can be. Should the identity be their wallet? And it can be also. No, yeah, I love that idea. Um, I have so many questions, but I also want to talk about the DAO and the, and the tokenomics. Um, so you have to, I, I just want, to, want us to move uh, move on to that. Uh, but yeah, just uh, tell me a bit more about it. How has it evolved over the years? And tell me a bit about the token, the utility behind it. Yeah, you know, so token is something we've iterated, you know, something we think about in the future. You know, we don't have a token yet. Uh, you know, the DAO and the token on how they work together has been, has gone through like infinite iterations. Uh, I think if we would have started with what we had planned, I don't think we would have been as happy with where we think we're at now. Um, and I think as crypto is evolving too, like how consumer apps approach uh, tokens and DAOs is vastly changing also. Um, so it's like, we're planning it for the future. Uh, you know, we also want to make sure that like, uh, U S regulatory, uh, concerns are better resolved as like, we're all, you know, the founders are U S citizens. We want to make sure that, um, those problems are addressed. So we actually have the freedom to build our company in the U S and I do think, I know there's a million approaches that one can take. They can set up the Cayman, the whatever, 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 you know? And I think like, um, I just think that like, we want to do things in the right way because we think discover has a very, like, it's not going to be something that the short lived, I think there, we have a very long road ahead of us. And I want to make sure that we're planning for that five, that 10 years down the road 
to make sure that we can actually properly do those things. But I do think it's not impactful to the user because users are still earning on the platform. They're still able to be rewarded for being users on the platform. And I think DAOs, uh, evolution of DAOs has been like insanely interesting. Um, you know, ENS is something that we've monitored pretty closely of like how their approach to stewards and whatnot. And like, uh, I've actually been like meaning to keep up, go catch up and see like, what's the progress they've made and like, how have those allocations been spent? But I do think like, it's a really interesting approach. And I think like the, you know, the consumer apps of the future that are really looking for that mass adoption also have to have their own network of builders and creators uh, that have bought into the paradigm of the protocol itself and discover the platform. I love how diplomatic you are when you were discussing the tokens. <laughs> so you're like, we're US citizens. We don't want to go to prison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Saying it. laughs> you, you know, it's so interesting, uh, you know, ex especially when Uniswap, um, Uniswap launched their token and there was a lot of push, uh, like, look, they're a U.S. entity. They're a U.S. company. Uh, he's a U.S. citizen. You know, um, they have faced no issues for their token launch, uh, and they haven't had had any problems. And then all of a sudden, uh, SEC shows up, and now they're though facing those issues. And like, like your heart sinks because it's like that you really like the team behind Uniswap. Like, there's a team. Like, if you could respect some teams out there in crypto, you know, Uniswap's a pretty easy one. And so you're like. One, you want them to win, you want them to fight. Uh, you got to respect any decisions they make. But like, um, I think a lot of people are going to be watching that, especially people who are trying to like create companies in the US uh, and, and make them crypto native companies. How do you feel about it? How do you feel about the US and the regulations and the um, kind of convoluted environment that the US has created and I'm I don't know it's not much better in Europe but everyone is content with the way the maker approach it and this is something that we as crypto native talk and discuss and I think we're kind of unfair and we're very biased about the US and we have this um, stereotypes towards certain individuals um, but how, how do you feel about it and have you ever considered moving out or starting the company somewhere else? Um, you don't have to disclose if you don't feel comfortable talking about it. I don't care. Uh, I think like, um, I think I, I care about like the subject. I don't care about like my, like my opinion being heard, but, uh, to me, it's like, it's really frustrating. Um, you feel like you're trapped in this box of like uncertainty, you know, like, I think it's like, if you're going to break the rules, you have to know the rules in the first place. <laughs> you know, It's like, how do you know if you're breaking the rules if you don't know the rules? Um, and like, if you're a company that wants to follow the rules, so what are the rules? Uh, yeah. And it's like, to me, that's kind of like the uncertainty definitely is like holding back innovation and growth. Um, like, I think brilliant people exist all over the world and are born in any country, any state, it doesn't matter, right? Like, but like, the fact that like the people, like us being citizens here in the US uh, have this like, these roadblocks and restrictions, um, it's like super, it's a very frustrating as a builder. So it's like, we have all these like brilliant people who are being held back by obscure uh, laws and rules without the ability for them to actually innovate themselves or innovate in a safe manner. Like, I don't think, I typically don't think people inherently want to break rules. And I think, uh, I think people who are, who have the ability to like truly, truly innovate within crypto or within blockchain or within Web3, however you want to say it. Uh, I think a lot of those folks are most likely um, uninterested or they're just like, well, let's see when things resolve. Let's see where things are. Like nobody wants the problem. Nobody wants to like 
have obscure issues. You know, they want to feel safe within their environment. And I think this is impacting safety for really brilliant people who uh, they want to continue with their lives. And so would I want to leave the US? No, not really. Like, I kind of like, I like my life here. That's chill. Uh, I've lived, I said, talked to you before, I've lived in London. Uh, I've lived in Germany at some point. Um, I had a great time, uh, but like to like pick up my whole life and move, um, it's possible I've done it many times, but uh, I do think I've got to believe like within the system and believe that the people who are the system as in other crypto builders that they're out there like continuing the fight to make sure that those rules will change. Um, and so to me, it's like, you got to support those who are trying to make, uh, who are trying to make good change and help define good rules within the ecosystem. Definitely. I agree with you. Um, my final question is, what are you hoping to achieve by the end of the year and by the end of the decade? And could yeah, you, you just know, put uh, that really? Sorry to interrupt, yeah. but you put that into numbers, like how many users, active users would you like to have and how many um, connected wallets would you like to have? What would you consider success? You know, um, to me, it's a really about, I'm looking at about 3Xing uh, numbers by end of year. So over the next four to five months, what is it? July, wow, time is flying. But, uh, you know, we're, lo we're really looking at about four or five Xing numbers um, and I think it's really about, and also like adding new metrics, like how do we bring, bringing on more developers into the ecosystem, bringing on more builders and increasing partnerships. And I think like from a core perspective of how many wallets are paired, you know, yeah, like we'll be increasing those numbers four to five X, but I do want to see. Like what my preference would be to see, yes, those numbers go up, but other metrics and new metrics emerge that we can focus on. Because I do think it's cyclical. I think you have the user, you have the creator, and you have the partner. It kind of forms this triangle. And I do think if you don't have the flywheel in place, uh, you don't see the growth that you need. And I do think like, yeah, we have a lot of users. We have some creators and we have some partners, but without focusing on the creators and partners a bit, it'll be hard to create that cycle. And I think um, to me, those KPIs, uh, how they bubble up into the KPIs I care about, it's really important that we focus on those because I do think if we wanna hit those like multi-million user numbers, uh, we have to basically make sure that flywheel is well-tuned and well taken care of. Yeah, thank you so much for that conversation. It was such a pleasure talking to you, learning more about this cover. We should definitely have a chat again in a year or two <laughs> and then hold you accountable to these numbers, like 3X towards the end of the year. I will, I will. You <laughs> could do it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for building it and really appreciate the chat. You too, man. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Uh, and I look forward to uh, our next chat.